What's up everyone, it's Dakota and welcome back to another modern video and today we're going to be playing the blue black murktide deck aka blue black frogs, demir frogs, whatever you want to call them. We did a deck tech on this deck on Monday so if you want a more in-depth kind of look at the deck then you can go ahead and check out that video but uh, we'll kind of give a brief overview for it and then we'll just get right into the games of magic. Of course, before we do any of that stuff, uh, if you're not yet subscribed to the channel and you want to see more videos from me where we focus mainly on the modern and pioneer format, along with some other longer form videos, kind of doing some live streaming, you know, the week that this video is going up and some other things like that. So if any of that interests you, please consider subscribing to the channel and ring the notification bell so you know when videos get posted. It's a free, easy way to support me and my content as we race to a thousand subscribers and I backhand my microphone. Uh, I appreciate all the support, you know, it, it does kind of, it does mean a lot to me and, you know, keeps me kind of churning out these videos and trying to get, you know, four to five videos out a week. So, you know, again, if that interests you, uh, please consider subscribing, support me in my journey here as we try to get to a thousand subscribers. Anyway, the real quick summary of this, uh, you're looking to get a psychic frog on turn two. This is going to give you a ton of value. It's going to hopefully hit your opponent. So it allow you to draw cards. You can discard cards to put counters on it. So it's a relatively quick clock. Uh, you can also use it defensively to kind of protect it against cards like lightning bolt and galvanic discharge. Although Galvanic Discharge is just a little bit worse for the fact that Galvanic Discharge does kind of scale up the more energy that you have. Uh, but you are able to adequately protect a Psychic Frog, and if your opponent's not able to get it off the board, you know, even if it just sits at 3, 4, 5 power, that's still a lot of damage. On top of that, too, you're able to exile 3 cards from your graveyard and give it Flying until end of turn, so it allows it to be evasive. And all the, at least like, I guess all of these modes, I guess if you want to technically count them uh help the card murktide regent which is already you know essentially a two mana eight eight preferably uh obviously uh as flying so it's also evasive on its own and then whenever an instant or sorcery card leaves your graveyard you put a uh, plus one plus one counter on murktide regent meaning that when you activate the ability of psychic frog to exile three cards from your graveyard to give it flying you're able to end up growing the murktide regent if any of those cards are instant or sorceries so if you have three in your graveyard and you exile three to the psychic frog you're able to put three plus one plus one counters on the murktide regent so these kind of work in tandem with each other psychic frog is going to hit your opponent for you know two three four damage you know that ends up being like nine damage over the course of three turns you play this murktide regent it's an eight eight uh ideally you end up exiling three more cards from your graveyard so this is like an 11 power thing this is a five power thing you hit your opponent for 16 you've done well over 20 damage and in a format like modern aside from you know maybe something like boros energy or like mardu energy most decks are not going to be above 20 so it's usually going to be enough damage and with some of the uh other options that you have in this deck you're kind of able to mitigate the amount of life gain that those decks can have thanks to cards like fatal push and uh being able to leave up like counterspell force and negation uh on the later turns because you're able to play murktide regent and demir frog or psychic frog excuse me for two mana but um this deck has been quite fun to play uh there's definitely a difference between having psychic frog in play on turn two and not having psychic frog in play on turn two so i tend to be a little bit more aggressive with like my seven card hands where if it doesn't seem like they have like a path forward like if they don't have like either one of these cards in my hand uh, i'm usually kind of shipping it back because i don't really want to kind of play that like you know, do I counter this? Do I not counter this? I want to get something into play and I want my counter spells to kind of protect these threats. So let's go ahead, jump into the games. Of course, again, if you're not subscribed already and you have not already done so, you know, whatever the case may be, you know, go ahead, subscribe to the channel, support the, support the content that we have here. And, uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and get into the match. So here we are with the match. We won the die roll. So we get to be on the play. We hopefully can go through this because i've recorded about 15 times just to try to hit it to go just like a few decisions in so here we are with our first hand we end up keeping this hand it's kind of what we talked about in the uh deck tech video and what we talked about in the opener at least i think i did uh, we have turn two psychic frog and then we have Force Negation to kind of back it up. We have a turn one play in Inquisition of Kozilek. And we have just a few more lands here as well to make sure that we are able to, you know, cast something like a Sink, sink into Stupor or a Force Negation. If we don't end up having to cast the Force Negation, uh, pitching the Sink into Stupor, things like that. So this is kind of the hand that we're looking for. We choose to keep it. We go ahead, play Fetch Land. We go and get our basic Swamp when we Thoughtseize our opponent. 
and this is what we kind of see here if i'm bring it out so we look at their hand and we can instantly tell that they are playing storm uh if the past and flames did not give it away or the rituals didn't give it away the past and flames gives it away so this is kind of what we see in their hand uh, we have a force negation is going to be pretty good for this past and flames if they try to go off and like turn two just by playing a bunch of rituals or like on turn three playing a cost reducer you know my thought process here is like if i take a ritual it's going to technically give them less mana later on. This Reckless Impulse is going to have to find more rituals, which they only have about six uh, of the, like, the Desperate... Six between Desperate and Pyretic Ritual, and then, of course, the Mana Morphoses. So I just wanted to try to cut them off mana. They're going to have plenty enough here anyway. Maybe it was uh, better to take the Reckless Impulse, just leave them with a bunch of mana, but I didn't want them to obviously have a bunch of mana like they were going to... Reckless Impulse. Actually, come to think of it, it's probably better to take the Reckless Impulse, but we take the Desperate Ritual. I, at least to me, I felt like we were going to have a pretty good clock with the Psychic Frog, and uh, we had a little bit of manipulation here with uh, an Undercity Sewers in hand that we could go and just play on turn two, or, excuse me, I guess we could play the Scalding Tarn, go get an Island, play the Psychic Frog, and move on with life. So, that's kind of where we're at. They play a Surveil Land. So, we are here and here. There's one unknown card in hand. They do their thing. Uh, they surveil a, another ritual in the graveyard. So we don't know what the their unknown card is, but we know that this is their hand. They surveilled a pyretic ritual to the graveyard. We draw another land, which is not ideal, but, you know, it it's, like, okay. Like, this other fetch land can go get an Undercity Sewer, so we play a uh, Psychic Frog and pass turn. They go turn two. They play the Reckless Impulse. They exile an Impulse and a Valakut Awakening. So, I mean, that's kind of annoying. They're able to use the Valakut Awakening uh, to kind of, like, refresh their hand if, you know, it doesn't really quite come together. Obviously not what they're looking for necessarily. So here I decide to play the Fetch Land. We drew a Watery Grave for turn. So I decided to pitch the Watery Grave to the Psychic Frog, just give it an extra point of power. Uh, we could go a little bit deeper, but I don't necessarily want to. I kind of want to hold on to this land. Again, maybe that's kind of like uh, a bad thing to think about. But, you know, I could see a world where, you know, we draw something like Murktide Regent and like Counterspell. And we just want to be able to have, you know, uh, the ability to cast it and then also leave up like Counterspell. Things like that too. Plus we have this fetch land, so we're, we want to go get our Surveil land. Hit our opponent for two. And then uh, we draw our Surveil land. Uh, the deck only plays two. So uh, that was a really, <laughs> really bad beats, and uh, I didn't want to obviously fetch and go get the Undercity. I want to potentially represent like a counter spell or the ability to just hard cast a Force Negation because now we can like sink into Stupor, whatever the spell is, uh, unless they go like a bunch of rituals into the Past and Flames, then we just want to Force Negation it. But you know, there's no reason to like crack this fetch land in case we drew like our one of Sewer with. 49 cards still left in our library just uh super unlucky there uh they cast the reckless impulse from exile they don't cast anything else they pass the turn we end up going and getting an island and then of course we draw another land which is uh kind of gets ridiculous at this point we have the toxic deluge on top uh we end up milling it hit with psychic frog draw another land so for those keeping track and you know the classic like i gotta get uh i gotta get my bitchin in while i can uh, we had Inquisition, Force Negation, Sink into Stupor, Frog, three lands. And from there, we have seen only lands. And the only other spell we've seen is Toxic Deluge, which is obviously pretty bad in this matchup, considering that they only play the, um, they play the, what's it, the Rowl. And then more than likely, the Rowl at this point is going to be played, and then they're going to try to go off and flip it. So not ideal. Uh, we could get more aggressive with, like, ditching these lands and, uh, Maybe that's like an argument we could have made to try to speed up the clock, but you know it, it is at this point it is what it is. We just haven't really drawn that many spells. Uh, they play Ruby Medallion. They go for you know all these rituals, so and they're getting to go off uh, casting Metamorphose. They cast Pyretic Ritual. They pass in flames. We decide to force a negation since we didn't draw another blue spell, and turns out uh, the pass in flames did not get exiled. <laughs> But, you know, they had plenty of stuff anyway to just end up winning the game there anyway. So we lose game one, even though we are on the play, which is a little unfortunate. But uh, it is what it is. We drew a ton of lands in that game. I mean, we have, we're have we 16 cards deep. We play 18 lands. 
20 if you count the double face card. So we had 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 of our lands. 11 of 18 lands and then 12 of 20 technically with the sink into stupor. And that was even getting to draw extra cards with frog too. We just hit a bunch of lands. And uh, the only other spell that we found later in the game is Toxic Deluge. So, super unlucky, but that's kind of what Storm does, is they, they win game one. We probably had a pretty good chance if we drew at least, like, one or two more spells, uh, depending on what they were. You know, especially if we drew the Murktide Regent, that would have helped us out a lot. But again, it is what it is. Uh, the Storm player had plenty of stuff kind of going on. Again, probably a misstep earlier for not taking the Ren's Resolve. Didn't really do myself any favors with the decisions, you know, looking back on it that I did have, but, you know, it is what it is, and we move on to game two. So here for game two, uh, we obviously get to choose to be on the play. Uh, we have some pretty bad cards in this matchup. Uh, Feed the Cycle, Fatal Pushes, I don't really like. Sure, this can destroy a Planeswalker, so maybe it's, like, good enough to stay in to mess with a Ral, but I don't think it's really going to be that good. We have a Toxic Deluge as well. That we have taken out and we bring in like the cosine of memories you know that are going to be get to kind of counter the trigger essentially stifle the uh, storm trigger which is going to help us out a lot we bring in the fourth force of negation and i believe that is it uh for force of negation and then the cosine of memories uh there's one other card that we didn't bring in we took out a subtlety as well I'm sure we'll, I think we're going to find it because uh, this game definitely goes a lot better, I would say. So this is the hand that we keep. Again, it is another turn two Psychic Frog on the play. And uh, it wasn't good enough last game, but it also we also didn't draw that well. The Frog did portray us a little bit. So uh, from here, you know, we're going to play, you know, our Undercity Sewers, uh, I believe. I'm going to, I can't wait to count myself wrong. Okay, so we play the Sewers. We have Force of Negation to, you know, as like a window that we can kind of play this. We can go and play our fetch land on turn two, play the frog, still be able to leave up Force of Negation and just kind of hope that our opponent doesn't have like a really early start. You know, we end up pushing down the Bowmasters because it's not really going to do us all that good. They play an Arid Mesa, say go. We draw an Archmage's Charm, which isn't really that good. Uh... Just because it's a, such an expensive counter that we don't really have an alternative mode to cast it, just like Force Negation. So, you know, we play our Psychic Frog past the turn. Our opponent's going to have to go uh, Rituals. So here they have Ren's Resolve. I debated on if if they played a Ritual. If they were to go, like, Ritual, then they could play, like, Ruby Medallion or Ral and then cast a uh, Ritual. I debated on, you know, just... If they cast a ritual, whether I just counter the ritual and get it out of the way or wait till like they play something else, but you know that there's the potential for them to kind of play around something like that. Um, on top of the fact that I would want the uh, necessary, I would necessarily want the force of negation for something else. So just oh, in general, kind of like a weird, a weird matchup, and some of the things I'm thinking about in these spots where. Uh, you know, if they ca if they do this, 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 then do I do this? Thankfully, they just played a Ren's Resolve. They do find a Ruby Medallion, so it kind of is what it is at this point. Like, we're ki basically kind of expecting them to uh, do kind of the thing where, like, they play, like, a third land and they play, like, a Ruby Medallion and then try to, like, kind of go off from that. Of course, at this point, we have Counterspell, Cosign to Memory, uh, Force and Negation. We have a lot going on here. So I discard one card. Debated on pitching the discard spell, but here I wanted to hopefully find something here. And uh, we see Murktide Regent, we see Cosine of Memory. I kind of want to hit the land so we can leave up Counterspell. This could be a mistake, but again, we you know we have uh, essentially 18 other lands that are 16 actual lands, two other like non lands, whatever. Our life total is kind of irrelevant, I would say. Um, so. I'm thinking like, okay, well, you know, I want to preordain. You know, I got to draw an extra card. I'm going to look at four cards or essentially five cards this turn to try to find third land. So, I, you know, I scry these two. I end up putting them both to the bottom and we draw another preordain. So here I could have uh, played the preordain, try to find another land. This would have given us like three more looks at it. But at this point, uh, if I think if we were up a game, I probably would have taken the risk of trying to find another land. But I think I really wanted to leave up uh, cosine plus force of negation. We have a clock in play. Like we can, we have things that we're going to be able to do. Essentially, we're going to have two more power after kind of seeing what happened. 
Uh, our opponent tries to go for a ritual. I just force a negation it. They go for strike it rich. Sure. Maybe the force negation there is a little aggressive. I even said it like to myself where I think uh, casting force negation on this is pretty aggressive, but they have three cards in hand. And then they only have like a Ren's Resolve and a Strike It Rich in their graveyard. So at this point, like a Past in Flames really isn't going to do a whole lot. You know, they're going to get to look at two extra cards. It's going to really depend on like what the other two cards would be if we think they're on Past in Flames. So um, we end up, going, uh, end up going there. So we decide to just hit the Ritual. Hit our opponent again. This time we drew, a, 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 unfortunately, a tap land in uh, Undercity Sewers. So we, you know, uh, surveil. We put that card into the graveyard, pass the turn, and we move on. We ended up uh, pitching the uh, Harbinger to the Force of Negation. Uh, and the reason why is because, like, I had that just in the fact that even though they play like mountains, if you're able to kind of, like, take them off of it, maybe that was, like, a greedy... Like, bring in that, that probably shouldn't have been a card that got brought in. Um, looking back on it, I probably, if we have the Harbinger, then we maybe can play, like, Feed the Cycle or, like, a Subtle D to just kind of, like, put pressure on our opponent from there. But, you know, that, again, like, that's kind of the decisions we made. I'm not super familiar, like, the Storm V, like, uh, you know, Demir Murktide matchup. I definitely made some assumptions things that i would have personally uh things that i would do and think that are correct uh i think that in a deck like this i want to play pretty aggressive to try to get them to zero uh and just basically like try to disrupt them as much as possible and you know with like the counter with counter spell plus cosine we're kind of uh pretty insulated i would say so here we just end up bowmaster uh we end up discarding the inquisition this is allowing us to hit for more damage End up finding a land, crack it for an island. We're gonna preordain, and I believe we left. Uh, we, we left force negation and the uh, murktide region on top because that's gonna help us close out the game. Not really gonna matter too because we have uh, lethal here. I'm fine with our opponent kind of going off, but here we're gonna counter spell, and then we still have force and negation, pitch ponder for something else, and then we also have the cosine of memory that we're gonna be able to play as well. So they were gonna need a lot of stuff, uh, even if they went like veil of summer as like a card. Uh, here, then we could just like force negation the Veil of Summer, and you know, life is pretty good from there. And they have two cards, and they have to be two really good cards to kind of win. Of course, they do have a Past and Flames that they did put in the graveyard, uh, but you know, from there, it's not you know, it's it's pretty easy at this point. Again, too, like we're going to be able to use all these cards, and we're going to be able to discard our draw step and then deal uh, six damage to our opponent. So, uh, game two may have been we might have made it a little bit harder on ourselves. Uh, trying to be uh, to try to hit land drops and try to basically like stay ahead and be able to cast our spells and also cast cantrips to find ways to close the game. But uh, in the end, we ultimately got there. So let's go ahead and take a look at the deciding game three of the Demir Murktide versus Storm matchup. So here we are for the deciding match of the matchup. Uh, we have a pretty difficult hand here. I mean, we have. A ton of interaction like this drawn lock more than likely is going to be able to counter anything that we want we obviously have just actual factual counter spell we have cosine of memory for the storm cards then we have a preordain here uh we're on the draw i think on the play maybe this is a little bit easier because you can just like cast preordain on turn one uh we're basically just looking for a way to win the game uh but i ultimately end up keeping this hand uh for the fact that uh, we we just have a ton of interaction. I think it's hard to mulligan cosine to memory and like a drown the lock too, especially with like kind of how our hand is shaped. Here um, we can eventually just get to a point where we cast preordain, but um, we just kind of have to like weather the storm. No pun intended. But our opponent goes strike it rich on turn one, and that scares me. Uh, I am instantly, you know, for better for better or worse like i i am like pissing myself right now because i don't know what's going to happen here we know uh when we talked about the storm deck that there is a lot of there's a few different ways they can theoretically win the game on turn two there's like the ritual into cost reducer into like rituals to like past in flames to kind of like do the thing and then with how this deck's set up it can cast a wish to go get a card out of its sideboard and either continue to kind of go off or set up for next turn, or just outright win the game. So when I see them go turn one, strike it rich, 
they kept seven cards. Uh, I'm worried. So uh, this makes me play a little bit differently. I just play the fetch land and I say go, and it's like, okay, if they do nothing, I'm fine with going and getting an Undercity and just, you know, getting to surveil, try to dig for a threat to try to win the game, maybe even a force negation. Because then at least with the force negation, I'll feel a little bit better of like casting like a preordain. Um, so they just play a strike at rich past the turn. We end up fetching, getting our sewers. And Inquisition is not something that I'm in for, uh, even though it, it probably could have been. At this point, I was kind of zeroed in on making sure that we could find a way to win the game because I think that was going to be the most important thing that we do is making sure that we you know find a win condition because we're not going to win the game just by uh, going spell for spell with them. Maybe we can, but I, I would just prefer not to, especially with the amount of disruption that we have here anyway. Uh, again, might be a mistake, but you know here I just pass the turn, leave up counter spell, drown the lock, uh, potentially spell snare plus cosine if it ends up coming to it. Uh, definitely wanted to, you know, counter spell something, but they just pass the turn. Then we draw a psychic frog. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna get down the frog. We have spell snare, uh, and then they uh, unfortunately frogged or frogged. So they go Manamorphos, they end up playing a uh, commercial district, keep a card on top, they pass, we draw, unfortunately we draw sewers, but we do find Murktide on top, really wanted to find an untapped land, because this was going to help us to cast Psychic Frog, and then also leave up, uh, again, leave up like Counterspell, leave up Cosine of Memory, I and mean, at this point we should probably be leaving up uh, Cosine with Replicate. Uh, but, you know, we unfortunately have sewers, we pass the turn, this allows us to, you know, cosine plus drown the lock or counterspell, really just probably cosine plus drown the lock, they strike it rich, we end up playing a frog just because we cannot play a Murktide Regent here, and then we're able to leave up uh, counterspell, we pass the turn, they end up casting a Rowl, we let the Rowl go, and then they end up I'll pause it here. They play a Reckless Impulse. Now, my thought process in this is that they play the Reckless Impulse. Uh, basically, we're we're kind of hurting if they have a uh, if they have a what's it? Uh, Past in Flames. But here they have like no mana. They're able to use all their mana to cast the Past in Flames. So they have to have like a, a ritual, like ritual plus uh, plus Past in Flames. To, to do it, so then they uh, end up going to three mana, then they, you know, cast the uh, Past in Flames, and then they have, like, Ritual, Manamorphose, uh, Strike It Rich, and they have this Reckless Impulse, so I'm assuming if they have that, they're, so if I counter this, they're going to get, or if I don't counter this, they get two cards, and then uh, it's more likely that they end up getting there, and then they have more Reckless Impulse to kind of, like, keep going, and then they're able to potentially flip this Rowl, so... My thought process is, okay, I'm going to counterspell this Reckless Impulse and then force them to have a uh, Ritual plus thing. Here they have Manamorphose. And uh, I think from here, like, the game kind of goes, like, haywire because uh, technically, unless that actually plays out right. So then they have uh, Manamorphose. They draw a card. They cast Pyretic Ritual. And uh, they're we're debating on our, our Ral flip. So, Ralph flips, which uh, is not the case, because I remember distinctively that in this game, uh, they flipped it with 7, and then they plus it up to 8. So then, if uh, they went and had a next turn, then uh, I'm, they would be able to ultimate it in the worst case. Um, but, uh, they ultimately end up going off and, and winning the game. They end up finding a past in flames, kind of getting to do their thing, and punish us for trying to cut them off of cards when they just had plenty of mana, plus extra cards plus ways of actually kind of getting to this point where Ral is going to be able to plus do the thing and uh ultimately punish us so probably played it pretty bad um definitely looking back on the game there's some decisions that i would like to have back like it probably would have just been better to leave the cosine to memory just knowing that they have something like a uh what's it like a veil of summer it's very easy for them to kind of like go through the deck go through it and we're going to try to cosine memory and i guess it counters like the triggered ability but i believe also that uh it allows you not to counter it i don't know maybe maybe it was just a, a mistake period of like trying to like counter or you know counter their thing but you know 
probably put in a bad spot. Not my best showing here, but you know, it is what it is. Uh, I try my best. I played a way that I thought would kind of help to win the game and it didn't end up being correct or rather it didn't end up working out. So that's like the best that you can do when you play magic is just to kind of figure out like the places where you made mistakes and try to get better and, you know, definitely understand the matchups a lot better. And uh, I think I have a little bit better understanding of the storm deck now and uh, definitely uh, some decisions I would have back. So let's go ahead. Let's go back to the deck screen and kind of wrap this thing up. So ultimately, what did I learn playing this Murktide deck? Uh, for one, I probably shouldn't be playing control decks. Uh, secondly, I think this deck was really sweet. I would like to mess around more with the, you know, some of the numbers on cards, you know, like four counter spells fine. Feed the cycle probably shouldn't be here. I think it's a little, it's probably a little too cute. The fact that uh, you can exile like the cards from your graveyard for like the forage cost so that you can uh, make... Uh, Murktide Regent bigger with like a feed the cycle in play or you can just end up paying three mana for it Totally fine kills a creature or a planeswalker. I don't think it's necessary I think that there's other removal spells that you can play here that are a little bit more effective You already have like four fatal push as well uh, Drown the lock seems like it's pretty good Archmage's charm obviously didn't come up in that game But I could see some worlds where it would be pretty good. Uh, I remember uh, a match that I played uh, to kind of like warm up with this deck that um, I actually had a kill on my opponent with Archmage's Charm. With I had like two Bowmasters in play. I can make them draw two cards, deal four damage to them, and then attack for lethal, which was kind of sweet. Uh, but, you know, just like uh, Feed the Cycle, I think uh, something like that coming up is like really cute. Obviously, the idea is that you can just use Archmage's Charm to draw two cards if you don't want to counter a spell. Uh, but I think for... You know, I think wanting to kind of keep your life total high and, you know, grab like your islands and swamps when you can, that uh, you don't want to kind of be stuck with this like Archmage's Charm. Uh, obviously, um, you can go get uh, Undercity on like turn one or like Watery Grave and then go get two islands. You could still cast Archmage's Charm. This might be a little too cute. I think that you probably want to play something a little bit different and obviously tuned to kind of like your meta. But I think in general, I would probably cut like Feed the Cycle, Archmage's Charms. And kind of leave it there. I think the uh, spell snares are a lot better than maybe what I give them credit for. Like I could also see cutting like one snare and playing like two pierce being better um, in some cases. I also think that like Boros Energy and like Nadu and stuff, uh, you probably want some sort of interaction for them, which is kind of where, you know, I wouldn't even touch like the fatal pushes. Uh, and the Inquisition was like pretty good. I mean, it, it's a discard spell that ended up performing as expected. So, yeah, that's my uh, thoughts, opinions on the uh, Blue Black Mark Tide deck. That's going to wrap up this video. I hope you all enjoyed it. If you did, please leave a like on the video. Comment down below what modern deck you would like to see next to show up in a video. Uh, if you're catching this on Wednesday, uh, I'm going to be uploading this uh, like a few hours before I go live on YouTube doing some uh, Bloomborough Limited to try and prepare for a RCQ, a limited RCQ this weekend. So as, as of this video going up. So uh, if you want to come check that out, come hang out. We're going to be streaming for a few hours, things like that. And probably more towards like the end of the week on Friday, depending on how we feel, you know, I'll probably just end up uh, playing some modern or something like that uh, before me and my co-host Randy end up uh, recording the podcast episode for Saturday. So, you know, go ahead, check all that out. Uh, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, you know, leave a like on the video if you enjoyed it, dislike it. If you didn't tell me, you know, in the comments down below uh, what modern deck you'd like to see next. And uh, yeah, that's gonna do it for me. Hope you all enjoyed the video and I'll see you all in the next one.